Good morning, future PTAs. It's not the morning here, it's the afternoon, but good whatever it is while you're watching it. <laughs> Hope you're doing well. We're going to start out with our introduction to our Rehab 2 class, and we will start with some brain anatomy and a quick overview. You'll have an overview in your pathology class as well, but can't hurt to go over it a few times. So remember the brain is separated into two hemispheres, the left and right hemispheres, and it's also separated into four lobes. The frontal lobe here in red, parietal here in yellow, occipital in purple, and temporal in green. Um, the artery, the blood supply to the brain is actually really important for this class because uh, determine depending on which portion of the blood supply is either damaged or blocked with a stroke patient uh, completely changes the effects of the stroke. So it's really important to know where the arteries are, which portions of the brain the arteries supply, as well as um, what those portions do so you know what symptoms to expect and the kind of recovery and uh, prognosis for that patient. So here in the front of the picture, we have um, right in the middle, the anterior communicating artery. Then we have the anterior cerebral artery on both sides there, the middle cerebral artery. Um, some of these I'm not going to name because I don't expect you to memorize those. The anterior communicating is important. The anterior cerebral and the middle cerebral are very important. The posterior cerebral right here, these branches, um, I also want you to know. And then the basilar coming down, kind of the body of this little guy, and the vertebral. Uh, posterior communicating isn't quite um, as affected. The anterior communicating is um, bad because it can block blood supply uh, between the halves of the brain. So that's but, okay, if you look back, you can kind of see that this looks a little bit like a stick figure man. <laughs> so this is the head and the body, the legs and the arms. So the head is made up of the top portion is the anterior cerebral. The horns or the ears, whatever you want to call these, <laughs> um, are the middle cerebral. The arms are the posterior cerebral. The body is the basilar and the legs are the vertebral. So that might help you remember that a little bit better. Okay, it's important to know what the left side of the brain does and what the right side of the brain does. I have this on a couple slides and I'm going to go over it even though it might be redundant. Um, the left side of the brain is your analytical thinking, your logic, language, reasoning, science, math, written communication, number skills, and right hand control. Now, if the left side of the brain is affected, then your right side of your body will um, be affected. So if you have a stroke on the left side, you may not be able to speak and you may not be able to write. Um, your written language is on the left side of your brain and also your hand control if you're right-handed is on the right side. So of your body, left side of your brain. Remember the um, it crosses for the body. So whichever side of the brain is affected, the opposite side of the body is is effective. With the right brain function, uh, you have your art awareness, your creativity, imagination, intuition, insight, holistic thought, music awareness, 3D forms, left hand control. Right side is affected, kind of your artsy free thinker type portion of the brain and your left hand control. So if you're more right sided, you may be more likely to be left handed, <laughs> but you're definitely more likely to be creative. So think about yourself and uh, kind of think about which side of the brain you feel like is dominant in your body and that might help you remember um, which side does what. Same thing here. I uh, don't think I have much. Uh, left brain also does attention to details, reading comprehension, movement sequencing, and expression of positive emotions. That's really important when somebody has damage to that portion because they may uh, naturally then have less positive emotions or less ability to express them. And it's good to understand that for a caregiver to understand what's going on there. With the right side of the brain, more of the nonverbal communication, your facial expressions, your 
laughter, your hand gestures, things like that are more controlled on the right side. Uh, your eye-hand coordination, spatial awareness, um, emotional compression, so being able to kind of keep your emotions in check is more on your right side of the brain. Um, body image awareness, postural control, perception of negative emotions. And as many times as I've taught this, I am reminded every time that I'm very left brain. I'm very logical and mathematic minded and not creative. And I have very horrible hand eye and coordination and spatial awareness. <laughs> so see what you are and uh, let it kind of help you memorize, uh, remember it. Now we're going to go to the functions of the lobes. Frontal lobe is your emotional control center. It also houses your personality. We typically say frontal lobe is higher level thinking. It kind of is one of the last areas to mature. And this is why younger people will often make poor decisions because the frontal lobe has not fully matured. And so some of the um, higher level functioning things like language, logic, long-term memory, problem solving, decision making, impulse control, initiation of like activity movement, judgment, social or sexual behaviors, and planning, planning ahead, planning things out. That's all the frontal lobe. So if you think about poor planning, poor judgment, poor decision making, poor problem solving, that might be explaining a teenager that you know <laughs> because their frontal lobe has not fully developed. With the occipital lobe, green right back here, uh, it contains our vi uh, primary visual cortex. So it's mainly uh, responsible for receiving and processing our visual input. It allows us to recognize size, color, light, motion, dimensions, faces, all things like that. Um, and if it is affected, let's say you have a stroke in your occipital lobe, then you could actually go blind even if nothing is wrong with your eyes because even though the sensory input is getting in, there's nothing to process it. So you can't make sense of anything that you're seeing. That is the occipital lobe. The temporal lobe um, plays a key role in our emotions as well. It assists with our language. Uh, it's responsible for taste, smell, perception, memory, understanding, music, aggressiveness, and sexual behavior. So kind of our basic foundational functions, our senses, taste, smell. Um, I thought there was one more <laughs> sense. Um, maybe uh, touch. Yeah, perception, touch. Yes, taste, smell, and touch. Um, our aggressiveness, our sexual behavior. So kind of our... Uh, innate foundational areas are the temporal lobe. And then with the parietal lobe, this primarily processes sensory information from the body and skin. It houses the, um, <clears throat> or this houses the processing centers for coordination. So it houses the primary somatosensory cortex. That's the blue area right here. It's our primary somatosensory cortex. <laughs> And um, it also helps with visual attention and spatial awareness. The primary somatosensory cortex, what it is responsible for is receiving and processing touch, pressure, temperature, um, even pain and movement of the body and skin. So basically our musculoskeletal system, what we process coming in from that system is primarily processed right here in the somatosensory cortex. The brain stem basically uh, controls the things that help us stay alive. So it controls our autonomic functions like our heart rate, our blood pressure, our respiratory rate, our reflexes, our digestion, all the basic life functions that you need to stay alive are controlled without you even thinking about it at the level of the brain stem. It relays messages between the brain and spinal cord, um, but it is primarily primarily things that you do not have to put brain power from the cerebrum into thinking. You don't have to think, breathe in, breathe out, or bud, raise your pressure a little bit. <laughs> 
and the cerebellum is primarily responsible for balance. It controls our coordination, our balance, postural control, and our muscle memory. Um, it is also involuntary, and so you don't have to think about what's going on at the cerebellum. You can train it a little bit, um, you know, with balance and coordination activities, but it's not something that you put a lot of thought space into. So a quick little overview of each of them, the occipital lobe, we think of sight with the parietal lobe, it's our sensory integration, our proprioception, so that feedback from our muscles, our temporal lobe, hearing, language, long-term memory, also um, taste and smell, our frontal lobe, uh, logic, planning, decision-making, short-term memory, the endocrine glands we didn't go over, they regulate um, and help with our emotional control, but the cerebellum we did, and it is balance and coordination, muscle memory as well, and then we didn't go over medulla oblongata, that's part of the brain stem, and it is uh, responsible for those uh, basic functions, circulation, respiration, those involuntary functions that keep you living and breathing. Okay, so a quick review of cranial nerves. You will need to memorize these. You will be tested on these. Most likely it will be matching. You'll have to match the number with the name and with what it does. So some of these with what their function is, it overlaps a little bit, like maybe they do sight and eye movements or things like that. But what I put on, or what this chart has on it is the primary thing it's responsible for so that you can learn one thing and not um, get them mixed up. But you may want to look, um, especially in like the score builders book or one of the uh, the big rehab book to just kind of um, update yourself on the other things that each of these do. They're responsible for more than a one word answer, but this will help you memorize each one. So cr cranial nerve one. And of course, most of you by now know the um, acronym. Uh, so some people say O, O, O to touch and feel Bally girls. What I learned in school was very auburn hair <laughs> because our teacher taught us. But uh, some people say vagina off. <laughs> um, there's another one that was going around too with the O O O, but I don't I don't know it. So you'll have to ask your classmates if they know a different one that might be easier for you to remember. But the three O's are olfactory, which is responsible for smell, optic, which is sight, oculomotor, which is your eye movements and your pupil restriction or pupil dilation. And then we go to the T's, which are trochlear, and that's primarily eye movements. Trigeminal face sensation, also chewing, like trident gum. So that might help you remember that one, but trigeminal is chewing and facial sensation. Abducens help move your eyes, but they help move them laterally, like abduction. So the lateral eye movements. Facial is... Um, responsible for the movements of the face as, face as well as salivation. The vestibulocochlear is your hearing and your balance. The glossopharyngeal is your taste and smell. Your vagus controls your heart rate and your digestion. Your accessory nerve, which some places call spinal accessory nerve, uh, controls head movements. And then the hypoglossal nerve controls your tongue movements. All right, so the spinal cord, a quick little um, review of its anatomy. Um, so we have the central canal in the middle, composed of gray matter surrounded by the um, white matter. Um, I don't really care that you know too much else other than the mater. <laughs> so we have um, a Okay, there's three mater. Oh, pia mater. That's the one I was looking for. We have pia mater, which is on the very inside, surrounded by arachnoid mater. That's the middle um, surrounding. And then the dura mater, which is the very outer layer. These surround the spinal cord. Now, on this slide, I do want you to kind of pause it here and look at it yourself and go through some of these words. Just write down any that you don't know the meaning of. 
you can look them up before class. If you can't find them or if you want to ask me, then um, have them written down so you can ask me in class the Latin word roots because as you're going through neurological terms, there's a lot of roots used. And if you know these Latin roots, then you can kind of break down a diagnosis and understand what it means. If not, it's going to be a really long, confusing word. So now we're going to switch to balance training. It's also a short little PowerPoint, so we're going to cover them together and um, talk about techniques for balance training. So we've covered center of mass before. That's the point at which the body is in perfect equilibrium. Center of gravity we also covered uh, in your patient care skills class. It's a vertical projection of the center of mass to the ground. Typically, it is slightly uh, anterior to S2. Of course, as you change positions, the center of mass also moves. Momentum is your mass times your velocity. Your base of support is the perimeter of contact between the body and the floor. So a wide base of support, your legs are spread, like the baby here walking with a wide base of support, and a narrow base of support, your legs are together. Make this a little bit smaller. All right, limits of stability is the ability one has to sway and to maintain equilibrium before they change their base of support. So if you're Michael Jackson, you might be able to leave, lean forward at a crazy angle before you step, but the most of us <laughs> would have to step if we lean forward in that position. Um, balance training challenges your limits of stability. That's how it improves a patient. It challenges those limits of stability in order to improve your dynamic stability. All right, there are three systems in the body that control balance. You will begin to know these very well and you will be tested over these. Somatosensory, these are the muscles, mainly the muscles in your leg, that provide information on the body position in motion. It's um, the muscles in the nerves, of course, there's nerves in the, um, like the meniscus and the um, Cartilage is the word I'm looking for as well. That give you a lot of feedback, remember. But somatosensory is that feedback from your legs. Visual is feedback from the eyes that provide information on your position and movement of the head related to its surroundings. So it just basically tells you, am I vertical? Am I tilted? Am I looking back? Uh, all that is from your visual input, where your head is in space. And then vestibular gives you feedback from the inner ear and it provides feedback on position and movement of the head in space with respect to gravity. It also will tell you if you're moving quickly versus slowly, like if you're spinning versus just turning your head, that is processed in the vestibular system. So we have somatosensory, that's the muscles in your legs, visual feedback and vestibular feedback. All right, types of balance. We have static balance, which is standing still. We have dynamic balance, balance, which is moving. And then we have autonomic, which is your postural reactions to an unexpected change or perturbation. So if you're riding a bus and all of a sudden it stops, your automatic responses are another type of balance control. These automatic responses can be broken down into different strategies for balance. So ankle strategy is typically anterior posterior plane, so leaning forward and backwards, and it assists mostly during quiet stance. So if you notice, stand up, stand still, and notice how you sway just a little bit forward and backwards, but the only thing that's typically moving is your ankle or the muscles in your feet in response to that sway. The weight shift strategy is a lateral plane, so side to side. It's your hips uh, shifting the center of motion in response to medial lateral forces. So like when you walk, you shift your weight over one leg and then over the other to put weight on each leg as you walk. That is a weight shift strategy. And if you're standing still and somebody comes beside you and you kind of lean out of the way or you hit a bump or something and you kind of lean the other way, those are also weight shift strategies. Suspension strategy is uh, using knee flexion to quickly lower the center of mass. So like if somebody jumps or a gymnast landing, how they quickly flex their knees to kind of absorb that shock. That is a suspension strategy. Hip strategies are rapid hip flexion 
or extension in response to large perturbation. So typically with larger movements, if somebody, if you're drive, riding in that bus and you're standing up and they suddenly slam the brakes on, you're going to immediately jolt forward and your hips are going to bend in order to counteract that. Remember the head-hips relationship. So if the head and hips both go forward, you're probably going to fall forward because all of the weight is forward. But if the head goes forward and the hips counteract that by going backwards, then it's equalizing your weight and keeping the center of mass over your base of support. And stepping strategy is essentially when the center of mass is displayed beyond the limits of stability and you have to use a step in order to not fall. So you have now moved too far forward and if you do not move your leg and step, you will fall forward. That is stepping strategy. Most of the time we use combined strategies. So usually while we're on a bumpy ride or um, standing still on an uneven surface, there's several strategies working together to make sure we're staying upright, not just one. Impaired balance, so these are reasons it could be impaired. So proprioception may be impaired in patients, and that would be common in people with recurrent ankle sprains that highly affects your proprioception. Remember, if you've torn a ligament or the meniscus in your knee, that can also affect your proprioception, degenerative joint disease, low back pain or dysfunction, and diabetes mellitus. Remember with diabetes, you have peripheral neuropathy, so lower input from the peripheral nerves, and all of these things would decrease your proprioception, making it harder to balance. Now, if your vision was affected, that would also affect your balance. So some of the things that could affect your vision are low vision or decreased acuity, um, peripheral field cuts, so like here it's called hemianopsia, so half of your visual field is cut, it's removed, and you can't see anything in that field or process anything in that field, and uh, that would be, of course, a huge detriment. A decrease in depth perception with traumatic brain injuries or strokes or anything like that, if the area that's processing the visual information is affected, then that's going to highly affect your vision and diseases. So cataracts, diabetes, they um, also affect your vision, either by blocking the vision, that's in the case with cataracts, or by decreasing your blood flow to the eyes um, and broken blood vessels to the eyes in the case of diabetes. Let me mention back here about um, vestibular. We will have a whole different lecture on vestibular system so that's why we only talked about proprioception and vision currently, and the vestibular balance training will be in a whole another lecture towards the end of the semester. All right, impaired balance. So this is the somatosensory cortex that I told you was housed in the parietal lobe, and it is where your brain processes sensory information. So this little crazy looking thing is, um, and here's the picture of where it comes from, that blue again. Um, what portion of the brain, the somatosensory cortex, um, is responsible for integrating which body parts and how much of the area is dedicated to those body parts? So as you see, this man, this is showing you, um, you know, there's a lot more um, area of the brain that is dedicated to processing information from your hand than from your elbow because we reach and touch and feel things with our hand and not our elbow. So a paper cut on your hand is going to hurt a lot worse than a paper cut on your elbow because a lot more brain space is taken up by that area. Um, you know, your lips as well. As you see, we need our mouth and we need to be able to taste and to feel if something's hot or cold as we're eating. And that's kind of a basic function to stay alive. So a lot of brain space is given to our lips and our mouth. Um, so if any of the areas in the brain uh, were damaged that process the information, so of course the parietal lobe, the somatosensory cortex itself, but also the basal ganglia, the cerebellum, any of the motor areas to the brain, whether it's from a brain injury or a stroke or any other injury, um, then that will affect your balance. It will affect your proprioception. 
and your ability to process that information. There are also a lot of medications out there that would decrease your process, ability to process, but um, more than anything, we have a lot of medications that have a side effect of dizziness, that um, they get uh, dizzy and feel like they're spinning because of the medication. And then impulsivity. So if somebody has had maybe a brain injury or a mental disorder, and they are impulsive and they have difficulty um, controlling their movements or whatnot, or possibly they have low awareness of their deficits. They're highly impulsive. That makes them have worse balance because they're not paying attention to the cues that they need to or to the information that's being processed. And oftentimes they are in a hurry <laughs> to get where they're going and uh, not looking for objects in the pathway. All right, fall risk in an aging population. I think we've mentioned this plenty of times in the past, but in case you didn't know, falls are common among the elderly. And some of the reasons is they have slower initiation of movement. Um, they typically will rely more on hip strategies because they have lower or decreased limits of stability, especially with the ankle and small swaying movements. They have decreased speed and use of motor responses. Um, and motor strategies reacting to external forces. So remember we talked in rehab one about power versus strength. Power is more important in balance training than strength because power is the ability to use that strength in a timely manner. It's the, uh, you're considering the amount of force and the time it takes to generate that force versus strength is just the force itself. So if their power is affected and they move more slowly, even if they have the strength, they may not be able to move fast enough to counteract the loss of balance. Um, other things that affect balance decrease anticipatory posture of control. So that's your internal forces. If you're transverse abdominis and your internal, um, your deep core stabilizers are not as strong, not as active, not as easily activated, then you're not able to hunker down and prepare yourself for external forces that are coming. And then decrease ability to uh, divide attention or dual task. One way you can tell somebody's at a high risk of falls is if they cannot talk to you while they're walking because they're focusing so much on walking, they actually have to stop walking to talk to you. Now, if they're out of breath, that's a whole different thing. But if they're stopping just to say a sentence, then it means they're giving a lot of brain space to their walk and to the balance portion. Okay, so um, the reason we care about fall risk is because increased falls, comorbidities, um, and reduced independence with activities of daily living lead to premature admission to assisted learning, assisted living facilities. Oftentimes you fall, you get some type of a hospital-based infection, you're immobile for a while, and you lose strength and you lose independence and the next thing you know you're in an assistive learning facility learning assisted living facility um, and most people kind of see it as the beginning of the end this is one reason that elderly people are so afraid of falling they see this process going on with friends or family members where they fall they break a hip and it was kind of the beginning of their decline and um, the bad problem is the fear of falling fear of falling often makes them change the way they walk or the way they move, be more cautious, to do things more slowly, to be very rigid and uh, stable, like, uh, by stable I mean like they're not, a, they're not trying to do movements, so they don't challenge their system, so it becomes weaker. You know, if you don't ever pick up anything with your right arm because you're afraid you're going to hurt it, your right arm's going to get really weak. So if you don't challenge your vestibular system or your balance systems in your body, they're going to become weaker. And so the fear of falling actually perpetuates the cycle. They get scared of falling. They start to walk in a way that makes them more likely to fall. They stop strengthening their balance centers and all of a sudden they're more likely to fall because they were scared of falling in the first place. So it's really a kind of a, a cycle that we have to break in order to decrease their fall risk. This next slide has just some balance assessments on it that are used in the clinic. Typically, the PT will give these either at uh, their initial eval or during re-evaluations. You'll see them a lot in the um, home health setting. And I would say to be familiar with what these are and kind of what they include, 
to understand the grading of these um, assessments so that you can tell whether somebody's at a risk of falls. But also you can use the different components of these assessments um, for training. For example, the Berg balance. One of the things that they have you do is pick a slipper up off of the floor to see if you can safely lean down, reach an object on the floor, and stand back up without losing balance. So you could use that and break it into tasks. If you see that that's something they really struggle with, and something they need to do at home, you could start out with cones that are high off the ground and have them practice picking up cones and then get them shorter and shorter so that eventually if they drop something on the ground, they'll be able to pick it up without losing balance. So it can kind of cue you on what functional activities to be practicing to get them more safe. You're welcome to watch these YouTube videos um, to kind of see what each of these entail. The home assessment, um, it's done a lot in, of course, the home health setting, but it's also done in the rehab setting before they're discharged home. Oftentimes, someone will go to their house or at least take pictures, um, you know, a family member bring in pictures from their house, and they'll make recommendations of how to make the home a safer environment for the patient to be discharged to. Um, so some of the recommendations they make are to remove the throw rugs, as you see, when they get a little bit wrinkled. They're a big risk for falling. Um, same right here with this power cord. Any cords that are crossing busy areas or high travel areas, you would want to move. Um, putting uh, night lights along the pathway. Of course, when the vestibular system or the muscles and legs either are not as strong, we're, require, we're relying a lot more on our vision in order to stay balanced. So while you're doing that, you have to really put lights on so that you can see. And so when people get up in the middle of the night to do something, if there's not lights on and they're relying on their vision to keep them balanced, it's a really um, high, t high risk time for people to fall. So um, other things is rearranging furniture so that their assistive device can fit through. So if they had a walker, they wouldn't be able to fit through. If they were going to sit on the couch, you might want to just move this coffee table all together until they're um, a little more stable. Um, adding grab bars in the bathrooms or rails by the stairs, anything that they can grab onto for balance. Using non-skid bath mats or um, mats right as they step out of the shower so that they don't slide out from under them. So there's a lot of different recommendations in addition to these that you can make as you're looking at somebody's home and seeing what's safe and what isn't. Um, and you want to make sure you set them up for some success. All right, this balance training we will go through in class, all the different types of exercises that you can do for balance. This is just some categories I listed, and there's a ton of endless possibilities that you can kind of put in each category. So we'll go over these in class together. Um, but if you would like to watch some of these videos, some of them are pretty interesting on how um, a Tego fall prevention, Tai Chi, aquatic therapy, and vestibular rehab therapy can all help people decrease their fall risk, become more balanced, more stable. Um, so if you would like to watch those, I highly recommend it. If you have questions, please let me know. I will see you in class.